There is absolutely nothing that compares to moving in the power of God. Being able to be used by God, moving in the anointing. There's nothing that compares to partnering with the spirit of the living God in ministering to people. There's nothing that compares. Thank God for all the wonderful things in life and all of the great things that, uh, that you know, are presented to us that we can do and, you know, travel and, 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 you know, eating and enjoying family, all these wonderful things. But there is nothing that compares to the presence of the Almighty God and absolutely nothing that we could ever do compares to working in the kingdom and being used by him. In fact, you know, you can be great and you can have a great name and you can be famous and all these things and there's really nothing wrong with that as long as you know God and you have that gauge of passion to keep you centered in all these wonderful things. But there's nothing wrong with being famous and all of that. But I would rather be a nobody and be used by the power of God. I really would. I would rather be a nobody and nobody would ever even know I existed or know my name if I could just have the privilege and honor to work together with the Holy Ghost and be used by God to bless somebody's life. Because the deal is when you bless somebody, it has eternal ramifications. Eternal. You know, sometimes you pray over somebody and you say, like, geez, I don't understand. They don't seem like they're walking with God or they don't seem like, it doesn't seem like anything happened. Oh, trust me. When you release the presence and power of God to somebody, it has eternal ramifications. What they do with it, which is something we'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes, but what they do with it is on them. But the point is, when you have that privilege of praying over somebody like that, uh, Carolyn, you know, praying over someone, it's up to, it's up to Jakima what she does with it. You know what I mean? And you can't be moved if Jakima, I would pray that Jakima would make right choices and live right. But if she don't, that's not on you. You did what you were supposed to do. You yielded to the Holy Ghost and you prayed over her. The rest is up to her and it's between her and God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that today, church? Just like if, if somebody prays over somebody who's sick and they notice a change in their body and they feel the electricity and they feel the power of God and they know something has happened and then they leave the place and end up sick again, that's not on the preacher, that's not on God, that's not on his power, it's up to you. Somebody say, it's up to me. It's up to me, amen. And if Anisha prophesies over you and if she gives you a great prophecy and nobody ever sees it fulfilled because you don't make the right choices and do the right things, that's not on Venetia. She did what she was supposed to do. She yielded to the Holy Ghost and told you what God's will was for you and what God wanted for you. What you do with it, that's on you. But it's no light on her or the legitimacy of her gift or anything of that nature. How many of you understand that? But there's nothing in life, nothing like being used by God. Nothing. One minute in the anointing and in the presence of God is worth, it's worth more than all the, right, Cody, is that right, man? There's nothing like it, man. Nothing like it. Thank God. Somebody say, thank God. Can you give him a thunderous applause of thank you? I want to, I, I, what I want to do today, I want to do something a little bit different than we normally do. Today, you're going to get two messages, and the first message is only going to be about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to take, take the next 30 minutes and just share with you what's on my heart. But, but the reality is, uh, I want Elder Colvin to share this message with you that he shared with... Um, with them downtown today at the curbside. I, I really, really, really feel like it's going to bless you. If it does for you what it did for me when he shared it with me, I just know you'll be blessed. And so I'm going to have Elder Colvin just share for a couple minutes. Now, what Elder Colvin is sharing and what, and what I'm sharing, one thing I love about the Holy Ghost is he's able to take stuff and just tie it all together because what I'm sharing, what he's sharing are, are two different things, but I just know that we'll be blessed. Amen. And hey, if the Holy Ghost hits you and you just take the rest of the service, I'm all right with that too. Amen. But uh, at least for 10 minutes, he will be sharing uh, what he shared uh, downtown. And then, um, and then I'm going to come back, 
come back to you and minister what I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to say to you. Okay? Go for it, bro. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hallelujah. <laughs> See, downtown, I don't have a lot of time to minister because people are outside. It's cold. It's snowing out. They want to get their food and they want to go. But I always tell them, like, look it, I want to give you, a, we're, you're going to get your food. You're going to get it. But I want to give you something that's eternal, something that, that's going to stay with you. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to say, I didn't get a chance to say, I wanted to say, the very, you might hear something I might bring across that could save your life. You know what I mean? They don't know. You know what I mean? Everybody's, I'll just, I want to get my food and get out. You know what I mean? So, but anyways, uh, I had just three short scriptures. I had no idea what, I, I had all these messages and you don't have a lot of time down there. So I just said, I picked a couple scriptures. One, and I'm, I know you've heard it before. Um, it's in Romans 12, 1. And it reads like this here. I know you've all heard it, but thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, I thank you that your people have ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is speaking and saying and doing in our midst. And I, uh, I thank you, Father God, that it goes forth and falls upon good ground and produces fruit for your kingdom. Amen? Amen. And it reads like this there, Romans 12, verse 1. You don't have to put it up. It's okay. And it reads just like this here. King James Version says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. How many heard the scripture before? Before I re finish the rest of it. Okay. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So I told these guys, it says, listen to what it doesn't say. It says, it says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to your addiction. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice to your circumstances. Present your body as a living sacrifice to whatever you're facing or whatever you're going through. That's good, y'all. That's what it doesn't say. So I was trying to, you know what I mean? So you got to like, like try to shock, even our people, sometimes you got to like shock them a little bit. Like this is reality. You present your body to God and nobody else That's right. to the, as a living sacrifice to God and God will take care of the rest. But don't do it to your addiction or whatever, your job or whatever, or, or if you got money or to your money. It doesn't work that way. You present your, as a living sacrifice, Lord, I present you as a living sacrifice to God. Because yeah. that's what's going to count most. And I read to the next verse on it. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good an acceptable, perfect will of God. Notice there's a renewing of your mind, not your flesh, not your spirit. So I was breaking it down for them so they understand. Your spirit, that's already saved. It's already taken care of. Yeah. But your mind is not. And your flesh, your flesh needs help. All our flesh, need, all our flesh needs help because our flesh wants to tell us what to do. When it's hot, it wants to be cooled. When it's, when it's cold, it wants to be warmed up. When it's hungry, it wants to eat. So, you know, you, sometimes you got to paint a picture because they don't understand that we're, we're three-part beings, spirit, soul, and body. So I was sharing that with them. So, so we need to renew our mind to come against, not the, not the spirit, but to come against the flesh. So the more word you're going to get into, you can declare the word of God because there's power in the word of God. Remember Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to what? The power, the power that's on the inside of you. Well, you got to activate that power on the inside of you. You got to speak it. You got to declare it. That's where the power is. That power, that power comes from the spirit man. The real you, the spirit man. So you got power. It's just a matter of tapping into it and, and uh, getting it out there. And the last scripture I shared, again, so you don't have a lot of time down there, but I read, I'm going to give it to you guys in the Amplified because I like the way it read. And I know you all heard this one be before too. I like to bring scriptures that they know in here and like and elaborate on them and, you know, get, get a better understanding of it. 1 John 4, 4 it says, little children or believers. Are you guys believers or dear ones? Or dear ones, you are of God and you belong to him. You are of God and you belong to him. And have already overcome them. Overcome what? The agents of the Antichrist. Because he who is in you is greater than Satan who is in the world. So you got to power pack on the inside of you but you need to activate that power pack because great and, and uh 
uh, greater than Satan and who is in the world of sinful mankind. So break it down short. Everybody usually says it the quick way. It's like greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If I got them just to get that scripture there, I did something good. So that's what my point, that's what my point is. I just want them to give them something positive. They can walk away. They can, now go through the line. <laughs> go through the line, you know, because that might save them. That might, the Holy Spirit will bring that back to them when they get in a tight situation or something happens, you know what I mean? And that one thing can save them from death or what have you. So that was my 10 minutes. So I just wanted to share that real quick. Woo, Thank glory. you guys for your presence. Amen. I mean, your, your Hallelujah. I really appreciated that scripture in Romans chapter 12 when, it, when he said, um, um, notice what it does not say. And I really appreciated that because sometimes what the word doesn't say speaks so loud. It really does. It speaks so loud. Thank you, Elder Colvin. Give him a big God bless you. Will you do it? Hallelujah. And I just want to get into just uh, uh, something I wanted to share with you. So Elder Colvin was saying with the last scripture that he shared, if I can open this, if I can open this. All right. Elder Colvin was saying with the last scripture that he shared that we have a power pack on the inside of us and we just need to activate that power. Well, I have a question. You don't have to answer it right now. Um, you know, you might want to answer it after uh, I share uh, for a couple of minutes the, the, word, the little bit of word I want to share with you. But how do you activate this power that's on the inside of you? How do you activate it? Just think about that and just mull over it for a couple of minutes as we get into the word of God. How do you? Okay, so I have power. Thank you, Jesus. I have power. Thank you, preacher, for telling me I have power. But how do I activate this power that I have? First of all, I don't feel like I have power. You know, for, second of all, my circumstances don't look like I have power. So how do I activate this power that the Bible says, clearly says that I have, and that uh, Elder Colvin, the preacher, clearly says that I have? How do I activate it? Okay. So just mull over that and think about that. But where I want to go to right now is John the Gospel of John, chapter 9, and I want to read verses 1 through 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. And we just welcome our live stream audience, and we just know that God has something powerful to speak into your life. John, chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. When you're there, out of respect and honor of the holy word of God, would you please stand? And we're going to read this together. John chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. And it reads like this. And Jesus, as, wait, let me start over. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Next verse. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? Because they understood. They understood the law. They were Jewish. And they were very well taught and very well bred within the law. And so they knew that sin caused death and sin caused sickness and disease and all of these horrible things. So they asked Jesus an innocent question, I would think. They said, uh, uh, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned and caused this to happen to him? The next verse, verse 3. And then we'll pray. Jesus answered them and said, neither, this is the part I want to magnify in your hearing, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So uh, before I pray, let me just say it like this. So uh, this scripture is saying that it was God's will for this man to be born blind. Is that what this scripture is saying? Okay, well, let's pray. Holy Ghost, we thank you and we praise you today for your presence that is in this place. God, I, I, I personally thank you for uh, Elder Colvin Lanthier. I, I thank you for his life. I thank you for his ministry. I thank you for the mantle, the, the mantle that you've placed on him that's clear. It's clear. It's visible. No one can deny it. No one can argue with it. You have put a mantle on this man to teach your people faith. And God, I'm grateful to you for that today. And Lord, I just trust you that you would just help us as a congregation, help me as a pastor, help this ministry to appreciate the gifting you've placed in this man the way you would want us to appreciate it. And I'll forever give you the praise. Now, Lord, I do thank you and praise you for who you are. You are the great teacher of the church. 
Holy Ghost, you are. And we give you liberty to fulfill your ministry in our hearing. I think that these people are not able to resist the very spirit and wisdom by which I speak because it is you and you alone deserve all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. So God, the best I know how, I yield to you as the woman of God saying today, Lord, I yield to you. I want to to spill over. I really do. I yield to you the best that I know how. I can't do this without you, but I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Now, Lord, I, I do release my faith with these saints that are in this house for the supernatural. I thank you and I praise you, Lord God, for the working of miracles. I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit bringing men and women to Christ. I thank you for that. With men, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And I open myself up right now to the very possibility of God. I trust that the warring angels are doing battle in the spirit realm right now over people's minds lives and bodies for your glory and father we will we covenant lord to make sure that you and you alone will reserve will, re, will receive all the honor all the glory and all the praise because once again you alone are the only one that's worthy of it and we give it to you in jesus mighty name and all god's people said Amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated, say this with me. Say, Holy Spirit, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your word, according to your word, in Psalm 119, verse 18. All right. So the title of the message today is Choose What's Best. Choose What's Best. The reason why I say choose what's best is because you can choose what's bad you can choose what's good or you can choose what's best so today i want to encourage you and exhort you to choose what's best somebody say that with me say choose what's best uh, why don't you recite this after me and say i as an act of my will choose what's best amen Go with me real quick, if you will. Well, we're, we're, we're there. Let me just um, read it to you in the contemporary version, the contemporary English version. This verse we open with, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. I want to read it in the contemporary English version. And what it says is this. Well, let's read it first in King James, and then we'll read it in the contemporary because then it'll, it'll just make uh, sense. So let's go to John chapter 9 again, verse 1 in the King James real quick. And it says this, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, verse 2. And his disciples asked him saying, master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 3, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I appreciate King James and I appreciate his effort to take the, the, the uh, scriptures and to make them accessible to people and to make them to interpret them in a way so that people could read them in that time period. I do appreciate that, but I want you to know that King James wasn't perfect and he did not uh, uh, translate the trans uh, biblical transcripts 100% perfectly. He didn't. That's why we have to study to show ourselves approved, and that's why we have to take scripture and, and, and we have to interpret scripture with other scripture. We have to interpret scripture with other scripture. And when we come to the word of God, we've got to come to the word of God with an understanding of who God is and, and an understanding of his character. We have to understand the character of God when we come to the word of God or we can miss it. We can miss something. We can misunderstand something. So to read this the way King James uh, 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 transcribed it or, or what have you, it sounds like God wanted this man born blind just so he could show off his power. That's what it really sounds like. Read it. It says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus speaking, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. To me, reading this sounds like 
God wanted this man born blind so that he could flex his spiritual, he could flex his power, his, his powerful muscle, and just show what an awesome God he was. Doesn't it sound like that to you? But I like the contemporary English version because it brings it out just a little bit better, which, which kind of uh, 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 confirms uh, the character of God, kind of confirms uh, who God is and brings better understanding. So I'm going to read it to you out of the, I don't know if they have it, but I'm going to read it to you out of the contemporary English version. And it reads like this, verse three, no, it wasn't. So remember what the disciple said, was it his parents or was it him that sinned that caused him to be blind? Jesus said, no, it wasn't. Jesus answered, but because of his blindness, you will see God work a miracle for him. I like that better. Uh, thank God for King James, but I just like that better. Did you get it? It just, it just really just, just changes the thing a little bit. I love it. It says, no, it wasn't, Jesus speaking. No, it wasn't. It wasn't his mama. It wasn't his daddy. It wasn't him that sinned. How many of you know that just because someone is dealing with physical illness does not mean that they personally committed something wrong that caused them to have that physical illness? How many of you know that? How many of you know that there are people that truly love God, they're doing their best, they're trying to live holy, they're trying to live righteous, and they're dealing with physical situations. It's not because they're doing something wrong. It's not because they're in rebellion. It's not because they're in sin, but they're still dealing with a physical situation. Anybody ever met anybody like that? I know we know people who are sick, busted, broken, disgusted, and it's because they won't do what's right. It's because they won't submit their will to God. It's because they won't fully surrender. We understand and we see people like that all the time in the church world. But I'm talking about people that really do love God. They really are for real. They're really trying to do this thing. They're really trying to do what's right. And they're still dealing with physical situations, illnesses, and ailments. So they're not dealing with these physical situations, illnesses, and ailments because they're in rebellion. They're not dealing with it because they're doing something wrong. They're not dealing with it because they don't love God. Anybody in the house with me? So, so we understand, or please understand, that ultimately sickness and disease is a result of the sin of man. So here, here's the deal. Because Adam and Eve committed high treason against God, Sickness and disease can come and visit anybody. Because Adam and Eve fell, sickness and disease can visit a sinner. Sickness and disease can visit a saint. Sickness and, can, and disease can visit a baby Christian. Sickness and disease can visit a mature Christian simply because of the fall of man. How many of you understand that? But the good news is, because Jesus came to restore us, because of the redemptive work of Calvary, we now have the right to walk in divine healing, health, and wholeness. How many of you understand that? Jesus came to obliterate sin, obliterate poverty, obliterate sickness and disease. Jesus came for that purpose, to set us free. How many of you understand that? But I love the contemporary version of this, uh, uh, the contemporary version of this scripture because uh, it's, it's brought out that it's not God. God didn't want this man born blind, but because of evil, because of the devil, because of the sin of man, you know, going back to Adam and Eve, uh, uh, disobeying God, God is going to reveal his mercy and his grace in this man's life. And this man is going to be healed. Let me say it one more time. No, it wasn't his parents that sinned. No, it wasn't him that sinned. That's not the reason for the blindness. Now, it doesn't mean that the man didn't sin. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all flesh. We all miss it. So it doesn't mean that the man didn't sin. Jesus was saying this blindness was not the result of something he did wrong. He was born with it. Uh, duh, right? This blindness is not the result of something his mother or father did wrong. He goes, but God in his infinite mercy and grace and wisdom is going to show you his mighty power in this situation. Amen. 
So what the devil wants to do is he wants to keep a lot of people from receiving their uh, or walking in divine health, healing, and wholeness. Uh, He wants to use condemnation to keep people, you know, I smoked for all these years, so it's only right that I should have have lung cancer. I smoked for all these years, you know. Well, how many of you know you don't even have to smoke? You can have a partner. You can have a husband or a wife who smokes, and, and they could do fine, and you could end up with cancer just being exposed to the secondhand smoke, right? So it's not your sin that caused you to get the lung cancer. It's your partner was the one that was in sin. They're the one that was smoking, but simply because you were in their presence and you were uh, um you were exposed to that secondhand smoke, you become the victim now of lung cancer. You see what I'm saying? So, so, but what we have to do is, we, so what the devil wants to do is he wants to use condemnation to keep you from your freedom, to keep you from your manifestation. Well, you know, I mean, for many years, you just, you did the wrong thing. For many years, you made the wrong choice. I mean, you were an addict for how many years and you just used drugs and da, da, da. No wonder your liver is messed up. And how are you to think that you have a right to believe God to walk in divine health and healing and wholeness? You drank like a fish for years. You just getting where really you deserve. That's the voice of the enemy, and he'll lie to a believer, a blood-washed child of God, just to keep them from receiving what Jesus paid a high price for them to have. Are you with me, church? You know, uh, uh, so Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, what does this this mean? So we understand in John chapter 9 that Jesus... Uh, wasn't saying that God wanted this man blind just so he could reveal his power. Jesus is saying, because this man was born blind, I'm going to reveal my power. That's what, that's what Jesus was saying. Well, what does Hosea 6, 1 mean? Hosea 6, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 says, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn. Anybody ever hear this scripture before? Anybody know this scripture? For he hath torn and he will heal us. That's what it says, right? God hath torn, and God will heal us. And it goes on to say, he hath smitten, and he will bind us up. And so you get these uh, people, they mean well, uh, uh, you're like just, just religious devils or whatever, but you get these people that mean well, and they say, well, hey, you know, this sickness that I have, I know God wants me to have it because he's working a, a greater work than healing in my life. There's something greater he wants to do. Like, you know, what he, he wants to uh, teach me humility, or you know what it is, is because he wants me to win the nurses in the hospital. So I'm suffering, I'm crippled over with this pain, and, and I'm, I'm just, it's just, it's just horrible. What a good God we serve. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. But anyway, I'm just racked with pain and, and, you know, and there's nothing the doctors can do for me. There's nothing that can help me. But you know what? Uh, God is using me. I'm winning the doctors. I'm winning the nurses. Thank God. And, you know, and, and God's just using this. So, well, well, and, the, and what I stand on the scripture that I know that has got to be God's will is Hosea chapter six, verse one, because it does say, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us. Which means that God is the one that put that sickness on me. He did. He, because he's a God that hath torn, and he's a God that will heal me. He's a God that hath smitten, and he's a God that will bind us up. Well, so I did a, a, a um, extensive study on this verse of scripture. I mean, I looked in every translation you can find, every legitimate, because there's some translations that are not legit. But I looked in every translation, legitimate translation you can find, because I said there's got to be something more to this. This, you know, God has torn Come on, there's something God has smitten. There's got to be something more to this. Because I do understand that King James translated a lot of the, of the things that happened in the Old Testament. King James translated, translated it incorrectly. Like uh, it, it, where, where it says God did this and God did that, it really means God permitted this and God permitted that. How many of you know that? You know, like, like you know, God didn't 
God wasn't okay with people being in slavery, but he permitted it. And I'll show you in a couple of minutes why he permits those things, why he permits bad things. So I'm looking, I'm looking in every translation I can find, because I know that this has to mean something more than what it's saying here, you know, the kind of thing. So every translation I looked at said the same thing. <laughs> Every translation. I mean, I did my homework, Pastor Young. And every translation said the same thing. God tore and God smit. Every translation I looked at said the same thing. Amplified. None of them, none of them said anything different. So we can look at it two ways. There's two things I'll present to you today. Two ways you can look at it. Number one, understanding the character of God, we know that it's not so much that he tore as much as he allowed to be torn. It's not so much that he smit as much as it is he allowed to be smitten because we understand the character of God. We understand that God loves his creation. He loves his people. He's not trying to make anybody sick. He's not trying to make, uh, but, uh, but if anything, he gave his only begotten son just so we can walk in health. To me, if I was God, I wouldn't have put such a great emphasis on healing because what matters is that your soul is saved and that you're gonna go to heaven. That's what matters, but God is so loving. Aren't you glad Pastor Tyrone ain't God? God is so loving and so compassionate. He put such a great emphasis emphasis. I mean, he puts healing right there with salvation. To me, in my human mind, in my human thinking, to me, in my flesh, I would think salvation is the most important thing. It should be in a category all by itself. Healing should be something, a side thing. This should be the most important thing. But God puts healing and salvation together. God considers healing just as important to you as your salvation. He was wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I was healed. Healing for you is, is priority, very important to Almighty God. Can you give him praise for that today? Very important to the almighty God. So, I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 in the Amplified Version of the Bible. Because remember what I told you, the title of this message is Choose What's Best. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, if you'll go there real quick, in the Amplified Version, please. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says this. I call, God speaking, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have, I have set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. So God says this, I have presented, I have, I have before you life and death, blessing and cursing. I'm a loving heavenly father and I'm crazy about you. So let me help you choose life. But notice what this verse says. It's your choice. Somebody say, it's my choice. Say it again. It's my choice. It's your choice. You can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. You got all these people waiting for God to bless them. Well, God says you choose to be blessed. I choose to be blessed. Somebody say, I choose to be blessed. We're waiting for God to bless us, but it's our choice. I choose life. You know, I choose blessing. So the Amplified Version says, you choose. God says, I present this before you. He goes, but let me help you because I love you so much. Choose life, amen, so that you and your children may live. Go with me real quick, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We do not realize the authority that has been invested in us. 
We do not realize the depth of who we really are simply because we're in Christ. We really don't realize it. But we really do have say over any and everything that goes on in our life. Now here's the deal. You have a sphere of authority. You do. You have a sphere of authority. Your sphere of authority over your life is 100%. Somebody say 100%. Say it again, 100%. The sphere of authority over your life is 100%. Now look at the person. If you have somebody related to you in your family, look over at them. The person related to you in your family, look over at them. If that person is under the age of accountability, you have 100% uh, sphere of influence over them if they're under the age of accountability. And somebody said, what's the under the age of accountability? Well, a lot of people say it's the age of 12, but it depends on the individual because some people that are 12 are really not 12. Some people that are 12 are nine. Some people that are 12 are 24, you know what I mean, kind of thing. So it depends on the person's mental and emotional and, and spiritual development. So everybody is not the same at the age of 12. How many of you know that? How many of you know that women that are 21 are way more mature than men that are 21? How many of you know that? It's true. Don't look at me all funny, men. It's the truth anyway. Women that are 21 are way more mature uh, uh, emotionally, uh, uh, mentally. They're just more mature than men. So uh, uh, if you get a man and a woman that are the same age, I promise you, nine times out of ten, the woman will be more mature mentally and emotionally than that man a lot of times you might have a woman and a man and the man's older than a woman and the woman is still more mature emotionally and mentally than the man i don't know why it's just the way it rolls it's just life i don't know why so just because a person is 12, just because you have five people in front of you that are 12 years old, don't mean that they're all in the same place mentally or emotionally. It doesn't mean that. So it's really dependent on the individual, but we'll just say under the age of accountability to be safe. So look at the person next to you if they're related to you. Look at them if they're related to you next to you. If they're under the age of accountability, you have a 100% sphere of spiritual influence over them. So you have a 100% sphere of influence over yourself and a 100% sphere of influence over that person who's related to you under the age of accountability, your child, okay? Now, look at the person next to you. If, if you have somebody related to you sitting next to you, look at them, okay? If they're not under the age of accountability, your sphere of influence begins to lessen. So you have a 100% sphere of influence over yourself, but you do not have a 100% sphere of influence over the person next to you if they are beyond the age of accountability. So although you have power and you have power that can affect them and power that can bless them, you can only go so far with them because your fear of influence is limited to them because they are not under the age of accountability. They have their own will. They have their own mind. They have their own uh, 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 capacity to make their own choices and their own decisions. Amen. So if you're a parent and you have a child and they're beyond the age of accountability, yes, you do have power and you do have influence in their life. But please understand that that sphere of influence is not the sphere of influence you have over yourself. Anybody with me? Can we just talk today? So you have a 100% sphere of influence over your life and it begins to lessen as you go outward. That sphere of influence, that spiritual fear, sphere of influence or spiritual authority begins to, to lessen as you extend out. And that's why we need the prayer of faith because uh, I can stand and believe for my physical uh, uh, healing and well-being. Uh, uh, I can stand and believe for it and get it with no problem. But then as the sphere uh, as it extends out, my sphere of influence, my sphere of authority becomes less as it's extended out. 
Every man is responsible for himself. Anybody with me? Every man is responsible for himself. So, you know, it's awesome. We have a move of God. Thank God for church. Thank God for the kingdom of God. Thank God for the family of God. I love it. Thank God we can come together and then all of our faith is, is mingled together. All of our anointings and all of the power of God within our being is all mingled together and you can receive and you can, but the, here's the deal. You might receive, but you're going to have to stand to keep it. So, you know, Venetia, you know, she might, uh, the Spirit of the Lord might come on her and she might start moving out in the supernatural and praying over people. And people start falling under the power of God and all of these wonderful things. And, and uh, it could be great and, and people could really receive from God. So, so it, it's, it's because we're in this corporate setting. Thank God for the corporate anointing. Thank God for the corporate, uh, corporate setting because it can help me where I'm lacking. It can help me where I fall short, that corporate expression of the presence of God, the power of God, and the anointing of God can help me where I'm in insufficient. But the deal is, as soon as I walk out of that, I am responsible to keep what God has given me. So like I said earlier, you know, uh, I, I just use, I'm not picking on Venetia, I'm just using her as an example. So Venetia can prophesy, I'll just say me, so nobody feels pointed out. Venetia can prophesy over me, and it's great, and it's God, and it's good, and all of that, and I, I even feel it. I feel the presence of God as she prophesies over me, and all of these wonderful things. But guess what? When I leave, I've got to do something with what I receive from God through her. It's my responsibility because I have the sphere of influence over myself. So Venetia can prophesy to me, but she can't make it come to pass. She can give me a word, but she can't make it happen and can't make it come to pass in my life. I am responsible because I have this 100% sphere of influence over my life. I have the power to choose to embrace the word that God has given me through Venetia or whoever or whatever, that, to embrace that word and to take it and to step out in faith and to do something with it. I have that responsibility to do that because I have a 100% sphere of influence over my individual life. I have a sphere of influence over my wife, but I don't have the sphere of influence over her that I have over myself. She's going to have to do something with the word that she hears. She's going to have to do something. I do have a sphere of influence because we're married. We're one. You know, our marriage has been consummated, so we're one. So I do have a, a level of a sphere of influence, but not the influence she has. That's why you can have a, a person in the, a powerhouse for God or whatever, whatever, and their mate can, you know, uh, 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 die before their time of sickness and disease and all these things. Why? Because you have a 100% sphere of influence over you, but you will, you will never have a 100% sphere of influence over any other human being unless it's a child that's under the age of accountability that is dependent on you. That's why the Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. In other words, while you have this window of 100% sphere of influence over this child, do everything in your power to instill the presence of God, instill the anointing of God, instill the word of God, instill biblical principles in them. Take this window while you have it, while they're under your care, while they're under your, your influence, while they're under your sphere of influence, because they're under the age of accountability, take this opportunity to get them as much of God as you can get into their life the bible says train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they won't depart from it amen and a lot of us miss it because we have this window of opportunity and we don't do that we're so busy trying to get blessed or we're so busy and we go to church and drag our kids to church sometimes but we're not at home instilling biblical principles in them while we have this window of opportunity to do it I was roommates with a person. I'm not going to say their name because then everybody's going to think I'm just, you know, uh, uh, just continually bragging on them. But I was roommates with a person, and this person went through a bitter divorce. They really did. Bitter divorce. And, uh, and, and so they had uh, custody of their children that they would get, you know, I think uh, um, on weekends and every other, whatever, whatever. You know how they do the, the whole divorce thing and all that in 
uh, visitation with kids and all that. So anyway, so, so this person had this situation. And even though this person was hurt, even though this person had to battle with, with um, getting over bitterness and all of these different things, and even though this person, you know, your, your emotions are everywhere, you know, uh, 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 divorce is a horrible thing. It's not of God. God permits it because there are situations and circumstances where it's unavoidable, but divorce is, divorce is not a good thing for anybody concerned, right? So this person is going through all these emotions and all these things. I'm just glad I was there in their life during this time when they were going through this. And so, but what I noticed about this person was even though they were going through the hell they were going through they made it their business to pray over their children every night they made it their business to do devotions with their kids they did they made it their business while they had that window of opportunity while they had that 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 opportunity to influence their children with the gospel they did it they prayed with them they would pray in tongues with them they would recite scripture with them they would have them quote scripture they would do devotions with them they made sure they would drag their kids to early morning prayer on Sundays at church they did everything in their power while they had that window they knew that they had that 100% sphere of influence over their children while they were under the age of accountability and they did everything in their power now, now, they might have did some things wrong. They might have did some things wrong in their marriage. But I will tell you this. While they were in my presence, the one thing they did right was they took that opportunity with their children to instill as much of God. They tried to get as much of God as they could get into their children. The good news about the whole thing is their children are serving God with them today. Their children are in church with them today, grown. Their children are all grown, but their children are in church with them today and serving God side by side with them today. My point is, you have a 100% sphere of influence over your life. Understand that. I cannot, I, I appreciate the fact that we have such a, 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 a seasoned statesman like Pastor Gene Young, who has been in the ministry and preaching the gospel for over 50 years. Do you get that? My God, would that be my testimony? Preaching the gospel for over 50 years. I thank God for her. I do. But guess what? I can't live off of her faith. I've got to, you know what, Tanya, I got to develop my own faith, man. I can't live off of my faith. I can't live off of her faith. I just can't do it. I need to, I can't live off, to me, Venetia, uh, my wife, has one of the most awesome relationships with God of people that I know. And I have been around a lot of people. I've been around a lot of godly people. I've been around a lot of people who truly did know God. But Venetia is someone that I can truly attest and say she has the most incredible relationship with God. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I don't compare myself to nobody. Sometimes I feel a little inadequate. I do. I'm not going to lie about it. Sometimes I feel, you know, a little insecure. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lie about it. But the point is, you know, I have my own relationship with God and I refuse to compare, but she has such an awesome relationship with God. You know what? I have to have my own. I can't live off of her relationship with God. I can't do it. Young person, you can't live off of your parents' relationship with God. You've got to establish your own relationship. And I think our responsibility is to instill in our kids. And, and, and so this person I was talking to you about, one thing that he did right was somehow, some way, he got it into them that they have to have their own relationship with God. And these people don't live off of the faith of their daddy. They don't. And I'll just tell you this. If you knew his daughter... She don't live off of his faith. She's got her own developed faith, life, and walk with God. She don't live off of a daddy's faith, nor does his son. So, so uh, what he did right was he instilled that in them. You got to know God for you. You got to know God for yourself. You got to have your own relationship with God. You got to pray in tongues. You got to develop your faith. You got to know God for you. And I really appreciate that about my precious friend that he did that. And what it was was he didn't know it, but he was being an example to me. He was, he was preparing me for the day when I would have children. He didn't know it. He was just doing what he knew was right. 
but he was indelibly, he was, a, he was influencing me and influencing my life for what was just ahead for me. So, to say all that, I don't even know how I got off into all that, but anyway. Um, so, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, um, wait, is that where I said to go? Where did I say to go? I lost my thing. Where, okay, 1 Corinthians, okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, there have no, listen to this, guys. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So I don't care what you're tempted with. You're not alone. We, we, you know, we had an awesome men's meeting. I think there was more men at that meeting than there is in the service today, than there's people in the service today. But we had an awesome men's meeting, and we were talking a, along these lines. But So it says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So you, what you're going through, you're not alone. Somebody else is going through it too. It's not going to break you. It's not going to ruin you. It's not going to level you. You're going to come through this. What you're being tempted with, trust me, there are many, many others that are being tempted just like you. They might not admit it, you know, because we all like to have the spiritual face at church. We all like to, you know, pretend we're, we have it all together. We all like to, sometimes Christians are not for real. And so sometimes we just say the right things. We know the right thing. We know the rote. We know the right things to say. Hey, how are you? I'm blessed and all this kind of thing. We know how to do all that. So we're not always real. But trust me, what you're being tempted with, there's other people being tempted to. So you're being tempted to, 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 you're being tempted with discouragement. Trust me, there's somebody else being tempted with discouragement as well. You're being tempted with sin. Guess what? There's somebody else being tempted just like you are. The Bible says, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Somebody say, God is faithful. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. So that means the temptation that you're in, you're able to overcome it. Because the Bible promises God is good. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that that you're able to handle. Isn't that good news? That's great news. That means whatever I'm being tempted with, I am able to overcome it or else I wouldn't even be tempted with it. I'm able to overcome it. Are you with me, church? It says, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation, I love this, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. He'll make a way to escape. Will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it or come through it or to overcome it, right? So he says, he, but will, will with the temptation also may awake, uh, make a way of escape. I have a question for you. That sounds awesome. Praise God. I love it. Sounds great. But we need to get this down to street talk. We need to really understand what he's saying here. So he says, we'll not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but we'll with the temptation also make a way of escape. Well, what's the way of escape? And let, now let's just do things a little bit different uh, than we normally do. Let's make this uh, uh, um, give and take. Okay. Uh, Let's make this a dialogue instead of a monologue, okay? So what does this verse mean when it says, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape? Somebody shout out something to me. What is the way of escape? Somebody shout it out. What is the way of escape? Come on. Come on, church folk. Come on, saints. Somebody say so. What is it? What It says, will, will with the temptation also make a way to escape? What is the way to escape that he's giving us what is the way okay prayer so the woman of god said prayer we'll take it prayer anything else what's a way to escape the word that's great the woman of god said the word so we got prayer we got the word yes repentance that's great the woman of god in the back said repentance so we got prayer we got we got the word we got repentance anybody else got anything what is the way of escape that god has given us what is the way of escape Remember, remember what was said, okay? Prayer, the word, and repentance. Remember, don't, don't forget that. Prayer, the word, repentance. What, come on, is there another way of escape? Uh, what's a way of escape that God has given us to overcome temptation? Anybody? Jesus, okay, so we got the, so here's what we got. We got prayer, we got the word, we got repentance, we got Jesus. What, what's another way of escape? Come on, somebody help the preacher. What's another way of escape? 
Okay, the Holy Spirit. So here's what we got. Here's what we got today, okay? So we got prayer. We got the word. We got, we got repentance. We got the name of Jesus. We got the Holy Spirit. Anybody else got a thought? Anybody else got anything? Yes. Peace. So the way, so, so, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. So the way of escape is peace. We'll take it. Peace. Okay. So we'll take it. Peace. You, uh, you got one. Yeah. What is it? Surrender. Okay. That's powerful. That's good. A great way of escape. Surrender. All of these things are, yes, sir. You got something? Taking every thought into captivity. Okay. He going the preacher, you he going to give us the word. Okay. Taking every thought into captivity. We'll take it. You, you got one more. Okay. Come on. Okay, Jesus, we, we said that. Okay, Jesus, but thank you anyway. Okay, Col Cody, you got something there? Yeah. Worship, okay. Well, <laughs> that goes without saying with figures. Cody would say worship, right? Amen. Well, will you take it? Yes, yeah, sir, worship, okay. So all these things are great, and all these things that are said are, are powerful, and they're true, right? But let's, let's nutshell it all. Can we nutshell it all? Prayer. The name of Jesus, the word, repentance, surrender, the Holy Spirit, uh, worship, uh, 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 taking every thought captive, right? Let's, let's just nutshell it all. What is the way of escape that God has given us? Okay, somebody said relationship. Somebody's there still giving me answers. Relationship, okay. What is the way, let's nutshell it. What is the way of escape? I'm going to give you the way of escape right now, okay? The way of escape is the power of choice. So somebody said prayer. Well, prayer is no good to you unless you choose to pray. Somebody said the word. Well, the word's no good to you unless you choose to use it and speak it. Somebody said the name of Jesus. Well, the name of Jesus is awesome, but it's no good unless you choose as an act of your will to use it. So the way of escape that God has given us is the power of choice. The power to choose. Anybody with me? The title of the message is Choose What's best. In Deuteronomy, he says, um, that to, to, for you to choose this day, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So it's not up to God. It's up to me. Somebody say, it's not up to God. It's up to me. Come on, say it again. It's not up to God. It's up to me. One more time. It's not up to God. It's up to me. It's up to me. Tyrone has 100% sphere of influence over my life. And the greatest tool that I have against uh, 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 living a defeated Christian life is the power to choose, the power of choice. Somebody give God praise when you do it. Our power to choose is the way of escape that God has given us, our power to choose. He, and we know that that's true because he said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Is that what he said? Choose life. So God gives us a way of escape. And that way, so there's a way of escape from sickness and disease. Did you know it? It's called choose. I choose healing and health and wholeness. I reject sickness. It, it, you know, you don't even got to get all silly and goofy about it. You don't got to get all weird about it. You don't need a paper bag. You don't got to throw up in a paper bag. You don't got to do nothing like that. You don't have to foam at the mouth. You don't have to have a whole bunch of people praying over you and you're manifesting and speaking in different, different, um, uh, 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 different um, voices and all you don't need all that all you have to do is say nope I don't receive high blood pressure I don't receive it I reject it in the mighty name of Jesus as a blood washed son I don't receive it but I choose health I choose healing I choose wholeness I choose for my blood pressure to be regulated I choose for my sugar level to be right I choose I as an act of my will with a full sphere of a hundred percent influence over my life and over my circumstances I I choose, I choose money coming into my hand. I choose to never be broke another day in my life. I choose to increase. I choose. It's my choice. God said it was my choice. I choose it today in Jesus' name. 
I choose to stay married until I draw my last breath. But please understand, my sphere of influence lessens when it gets to my, my wife. So she might choose something different. And, you know, and then that's, that's not on me. She might choose something different. Amen. But the deal is I choose as an act of my will. I choose not to fall apart as I age. I choose as an act of my will. Anybody in the house with me? I Listen, young person, I choose to be a success in life. I don't accept anything else. I don't accept failure. I choose to succeed in life. I choose to be wealthy. He says that he, God desires, um, God delights in the prosperity of his servants. I choose to serve God every day of my life, and I choose to prosper. I choose. Anybody in the house with the preacher today? All right. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Go to Joshua 24. Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. We're talking today about the power, or I'm, excuse me, we're talking today about choosing what's best. Choosing what's best. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose, there that word is again, choose, somebody say choose, choose you this day. Listen, I can't do anything about yesterday. Yesterday is a canceled check. There's nothing I can do. Yesterday is long gone, okay? Uh, tomorrow, you know, tomorrow is promised to me. Let me just say that real quick. It's a freebie. Tomorrow is promised to you if you're a blood-washed child of God, just so you know. You ever hear people say tomorrow's not promised? Don't listen to that lie. It's promised to you. Because I choose to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I choose long life. He said, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my great salvation. Guess what? Tomorrow is promised to me. Now, my sphere of influence lessens as I, as I extend out. So tomorrow might not be promised to you. But guess what? It's promised to me. All right. So, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day. It's about today. It's about this moment. I choose to do what's right this moment. Some people, they get all flustered because they, they're so always thinking ahead, always thinking in advance. Not that that's always wrong. I'm just saying that it's about today. Can you just live right today? Can you just do the right thing today? Can you just choose what's right today? Listen, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So listen, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, the black culture, there's no culture that's better than any other culture, but the black culture is a beautiful culture. It really is. And I don't regret the fact that God chose for me to be born in the black culture. I, I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it. I, I really am. And just like if you were born in the white culture, you should be appreciative and glad you were born in the white culture. And if you were born in the Latino, Latino court culture, be blessed and thank God you were born in that culture. But I'm, I'm blessed and, and fortunate that I was born in the black culture. Let me tell you something about the black culture. Black women are tough. Black women are strong. Black women are independent. Listen, you are out for a walk going nowhere if you think you're going to boss a black woman. It ain't going to happen. So... What I, so what I like to do is I like to mess with my wife. You can't get any stronger than her. You can't get any more independent than her. You just can't. But I like to mess with her. I like to tell her, you're going to do what I say. You know, this is what I do. I just joke with her. My girls will tell you. I do it all the time. I bet you you're going to do what I say, and I'll, tell, I'll show you better than I can tell you. And she's always so sweet, and she's like, Tyrone, stop it. Tyrone, stop it. I'm like, you're going to do what I tell you to do. One thing I can guarantee you is Elder Coleman ain't saying that to his wife. All right? He's not saying And I'll tell you another thing. Jeff ain't saying it. Jeff ain't saying it to his wife. Okay? Because black women are 
a, a, a breed of their own. They're just independent, they're strong, and of course there's a history and there's a reason why that they have been forced to be the women that they are. It's a good thing, you know, with the enemy meant for evil, God took it and turned it around for good. And so it's a good thing that the black women are the way they are. And I wouldn't want a woman who was milk toast. I wouldn't want a woman who was weak. I just wouldn't. It wouldn't be attractive to me. I play with my wife and I joke with her and like, I'm the boss and you gonna do what I, I run this and I do all that as a joking thing with her, but I, I wouldn't want a woman that I had to be that kind of man with. I wouldn't want a woman like that. It wouldn't even attract me. So, but my point is that one thing I will do, don't care if my wife is black, purple, or green, one thing this man will do is command his house in the ways of the Lord. That's one thing I will do, and I will not take no for an answer. It will not be any other way. Jesus is Lord of my home, and that's period. What's good or what's better? Jesus always honors our choosing what's better over what's good. Now, what I'm about to say, in no way, shape, or form, am I saying this to bring condemnation or guilt or anything like that to anybody. I'm just trying to be real with who I am as a person, okay? Just trying to be real. I have not arrived. I have no corner on anything. Uh, uh, I am dependent on all of the people that work with me. You know, every joint supplies. I'm in desperate need of, of the people that, that uh, work together with me in the ministry. I really am, and I have no shame in admitting it. So in no way, shape, or form, I don't want to, uh, you to misconstrue my statement that I'm about to make as if I'm saying that I have it together or I have arrived or anything of that nature because, you know, I'm not dumb, and, and that's not true, all right? But what I will say is this. If it were me, and I have been in this situation before, I would rather be on public assistance then work and stay out of the fellowship of the saints on a Sunday. That's just me. I, I'm not putting that off on anybody else. I'm not. I know that in our society, money is very important. I know that it, it, in certain family circles, uh, um, some people get more excited about a person having a job than them being in church on a Sunday. Well, praise God, at least, they, at least they're making money. And, and my spirit cringes. I'm like, so what if they're making money? They're not growing spiritually. They're not developing spiritually. They're, not, they're, they're missing out on the blessings that God has for them. So what if they're making money? Are you kidding me? But there are people that are like that. They're, that's just their motivation. Well, you know what? They're not in church, but hey, they're working. They're making money. I, 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 I don't put it off on anybody. Everybody does what they, they have a relationship with God. They do whatever they got to do. If it were me, I would rather be in church on Sunday. I would rather tell my boss, use the law for my benefit and say, it's my religious obligation to be in church on Sunday. Because don't you know they can't make you work on Sunday if it's your religious obligation? Most places. So if I'm working in a place where they will make me work, I'll leave. Listen, either God is who he says he is or he's not. Do you think that God is limited to that one job you're working? Is God big enough to get you a bigger and better job where you can be in the house of the Lord on Sundays? I, there was one time when I had a job that would, would demand that I would work on a Sunday. It wasn't every Sunday, but I would work on Sundays here and there. I just couldn't do it, y'all. I couldn't do it. I needed to be in the house of God. I needed to be in the fellowship of the saints. I, need to be, I needed to be exposed to the corporate anointing. You was not going to get me to work on a Sunday. It wasn't going to happen. If I got to eat cornbread and beans, which I happen to like anyway, but anyway, but if I, <laughs> praise God, but if I got to eat cornbread and beans, I'm going to eat cornbread and beans and I'm going to be in church. Listen, if I don't have nothing to tithe, I would choose being in church rather than having something to tithe. Why? Because the church is not dependent on my tithe. Even if the church is of God, God will take care of it. God will provide for that church. The church ain't dependent on my tithe. I would rather not tithe and be in church and be exposed to the corporate anointing and be in the fellowship of the saints. I can't do it. I don't know how people do it. I, can't, I cannot. My conscience won't let me work every single Sunday. 
My conscience won't let me do it because of my passion for God. Now, if, if I'm speaking to somebody, don't get mad at me, and somebody does work every Sunday, you should be actively believing God and with your resume and looking for another opportunity, looking for another job. You should refuse. You have the power of choice. You should refuse and say, I will not be out of the, out of the church, out of the fellowship of the saints every week. Not me. I will not allow it in Jesus' name. Boy, you don't get no applause with that one. You don't get an applause with that one, but it's true anyway. I wish somebody would applause just to make me feel a little better. I mean, sure. It's true whether you like it or not. It's true. This is, to God, this is priority. But anyway, moving along. So it says in Hebrews chapter 11, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 says... And then I just have two more scriptures to read and we're out. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. How many remember Tanya teaching about this last week? A more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So here's what this verse is saying. What, what, um, what Cain did was good, he did give a sacrifice to God. What Cain did was good, but what, but what Abel did was best. It's good to work. A man ought to work. If a man wants to eat, he ought to work. It's good to work. But the Bible's very clear. Six days shall a man work. On the seventh day, you're to keep it holy. It belongs to the Lord. That's the Bible. So if you're working on a Sunday, you're out of the will of God. I know you're making a check, but you are out of God's will. And listen, you can't afford to be out of God's will because when you get out of God's will, you open yourself up to things. Can the preacher help you today? Now, I know, I'm, I know there's some folks sitting here, money is important to them, so they don't like this, but it's true anyway. They could take it up with God. Don't take it up with me. You are out of God's will if you are working a job that keeps you out of church every Sunday. And when you're out of God's will, then there's all kinds of things that can be affected. Your protection, your blessing. You, you, listen, there's no way you can't backslide when you're not when, when, when you miss church every single week, week after week, there's no way you're not backsliding in your heart. There's no way. No, I'm strong in the Lord. <laughs> I never go to church. I'm strong in the Lord. Yeah, yourself, what we call self-deceived. And preachers need to preach this, but there's no, they just want the money. I don't want your money. I don't need your money. You need to be in the presence of God. You need to be in the house of God. I don't want your money. And I have to stand before a holy God, so I'm going to tell it. I'm not afraid of standing before my wife. I'm not afraid of standing before you. I fear standing before my God. If you work on Sundays, you're out of the will of God. If you're in a situation where you have to work a Sunday a month or every other Sunday, you should be actively believing God for a better opportunity so you don't have to work on Sundays. We can pray, but don't forget what I said. Our sphere of influence lessens as we extend out. So we can pray and we can believe God to, 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 for you to be able to be in service and da 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 but if that person isn't believing for that. And some people have been delivered from much. You don't want to go back to what you've been delivered from because it'll be way worse. Way worse to get out of it. Are you with me, church? Go jump down to verse 24, please. Verse 24. Verse 24 says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know, that's prestige, okay? That's, that's power. 
That, that's, you know, everybody's looking for prestige. Everybody's looking for a name. Everybody's looking for power. Everybody's looking to be, you know, be reckoned. Most of the things that people are motivated, most things people do that they're motivated to do, they do it for other people because they want to be recognized. They want to be seen. They want the prestige. They want the power, da 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 and the world does that. It gives us that message that you ain't nothing unless you got prestige, unless you got power, unless you got money, unless you got a name. Who are you? You're nothing and all this kind of thing. But Moses made a choice. He chose not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He made that choice. Go to verse 25, please. Verse 25. Choosing, there's the word, choosing. It was his choice. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Next verse, verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. How many of you know Jesus hadn't even come yet? But the Bible says Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. I, there's a verse uh, where, you know, there's this sorcerer trying to mimic the power of God that he saw the disciples working in in the book of Acts. And the apostle turned to him and said, y your money perish with you. Hear me, it's not all about the money. We understand money pays bills, but it's about God. And when you put God first, you ain't going to want for nothing. Not if you put him first. Esteeming the reproach. It's not even God's will. You can see these people, they're working overtime and all. I mean, work just killing themselves, working all this overtime. And this and that. Some people, they never see their families. They're just always working overtime and all that. I got to, listen, I decided just a little while ago, I said, they ain't gonna, my job is not going to be keeping me here. I'm not doing it. Family is important. And then my job will say that. Family is priority. Family is important. I'm not going to be doing that. You see, working overtime, you're never with your family and all this, and people working 16 hours a day. You know, that's not God. That's a lack of faith. Something is wrong. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to get an applause with that one either. Okay, verse, <laughs> go, <laughs> go, to verse, go to verse 35, verse 35, verse 35. It says, women receive their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. So deliverance in this situation is good, right? It says, uh, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, listen, what's best is for you to obey me and follow me and put me first. That's what's best. It's good that you want to honor your father, but I'm your heavenly father. I come first. Somebody say, God comes first. Somebody say, God comes first. Say it again, God comes first. I, I, I don't, you know, I, 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 people probably don't like that I do this, but I just want to say one more thing about my wife that I appreciate about her. So my wife is so passionate for God that she wants to make sure she does everything right. This is just her. She wants to make sure she does everything right. So she got an inheritance uh, you know, she got an inheritance. And so she wanted to make sure that she did what was right by God. So she probably asked me a hundred questions about how she should do this and, and how much da 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 and da da da. And, and her whole motivation was I just want to do what's best. I just want to do what's best best. So her thing wasn't, oh, I'm going to buy me a piece of jewelry. Her thing wasn't, oh, I'm going to do, I want to do, or da, da, da. Her whole thing that I heard that she was talking to me about was how much she's supposed to give and, and, and how she's supposed to do it and da, 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 da. I just want to make sure I do what's best before my God. What to God that God's people were like that. People looking to get all they can can all they get and sit on their can. Just saying. Okay, verse 61. Verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. How many of you know that's a good thing? 
You're, you're not leaving loose ends. You're going and you're saying goodbye. Listen, now Jesus called me to follow him. I just want to let y'all know, and I want to say goodbye. How many of you know that's a good thing? Is that a good thing? Is it a good thing? Is it a good thing? Jesus said it's a good thing, but it ain't the best thing. Jesus said, go to verse uh, 62. Jesus said, and Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now that should be a scary verse for us. No man who looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. People think back, backsliding, it's a risk you don't want to take. Don't backslide. It's a risk you don't want to take. Jesus said, whoever looks back is not fit for the kingdom. It's a risk you don't want to take. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's a risk you don't want to take. Amen. Okay, go with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 38 real quick. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 real quick. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It's about choosing what's best. And what's best always glorifies God. What's best always puts him first and center. Always. In your relationships, you know, young people, when you're getting married, choose what's best. Don't just accept anything. Don't settle. Choose what's best. Is it going to glorify God? Is it putting him center? Is, is, is it making him first place? You understand what I'm saying? Don't settle. Choose what's best. If you have to wait, listen, I'd rather wait until I was 50 and get the best than to settle. And Jesus is not glorified. And Jesus is not center. I'd rather just wait until I'm 50 or I would rather be alone. Do you ever hear that saying, you can do better alone than you can't, amen? You want it to be something that's going to benefit the kingdom, glorify the name of Jesus, put him first and center. That's what you want, amen. All right, you don't got to say amen. I'll say amen for you, amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Verse 39, verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Verse 40, verse 40. Now, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. I mean, I could see Martha's uh, a problem, can't you? I mean, she, what she, she's got a house of people. She's got guests. You know, she's trying to be hospitable. You know, she's trying to cook and make sure that the people have what they need. You need something to drink or, you know, can I, you know, you want to put your feet up here? You know, she's trying to make sure that these people are comfortable, but she's working all by herself. Mary ain't doing a thing. So Martha is by herself working and cooking and sweating, and she's looking over at Jesus thinking, like, doesn't he realize that I'm doing all this work by myself, and Mary ain't doing nothing except sitting there listening to him, to him tea? Okay, go. Next verse, verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto Martha, 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 thou art careful and troubled about many things. Verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. I'll never forget I heard a message from uh, Joyce Meyer one time, and she was talking about how you know, she was a little obsessive with her housekeeping and everything had to be perfect, everything had to be clean, everything had to be spotless, da da da. And she would have a preaching engagement. She couldn't even go preach unless every there just couldn't be a dish in the sink. The couldn't be the sink had to be wiped. There couldn't be no no moisture or nothing. Everything had to be vacuumed. Everything had to be perfect. You know, she was just cumbered about like Martha. You know, until one day she got set free and said, "So what if the dishes sit in the sink? I'm, what I'm doing is best. What I'm doing is better. What I'm doing is right. I'm seeking." God for God's people, and I'm going to preach this gospel. So what if the dishes sit in the sink? Now, I'm not saying to live in refuse and to live, you know, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is when it comes to making sure your, ho your house is spotless or when it comes to sitting at the feet of Jesus, how many of you know it's better to sit at the feet of Jesus than to have a spotless house? Some people don't even pray because they're so busy making the house spotless. Who cares if the house is spotless if you can't even get a prayer through heaven? The one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She chose the best, and the best is me.
What you're doing, Martha, is good, but she chose the best. So Martha might get a lot of praise, you know. Oh, what a wonderful home. Oh, the food is so delicious. Oh, you know, you did such a great job. Da, 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 da. She might get all the praise and accolades of the men, but how many of you know it's better to get praise and accolades from Jesus? Jesus said, Mary chose the better thing. Mary chose what's best. Are you with me, church? I said, are you with me? Do you believe it? First Corinthians, Tanya, I think you got more of a rouse uh, last week than I'm getting, but that's okay. I'm not in it for the rouse. Go with me. This is the last scripture in closing. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It's about choosing what's best. How do you judge what's best? Does it glorify God? Does it, does it have Jesus center? And sir, is, he, is he the center? That's how you know it's best. You know, uh, you, you can have a, listen, you can have a set list. Let me talk to the worship people for a minute. You can have a set list. And guess what? The set list may be good, but is it best? Let me talk to the preachers for a minute. Preacher, you might have a message, and the message might be good. But is it best? You, you, listen, listen, you might have a great message. All your I's are dotted, all your T's are crossed. But if, if that thing ain't God-breathed, if that thing ain't God-inspired, it's not the best. If your message isn't glorifying him and making him center, then it's not the best. It might be good but it's not the best. Keep on preaching and don't look at their faces. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's what we're going to close this thing with. Whether you, wherefore, therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, whatever it is, do all to the glory of God. When you go to work tomorrow, don't go to work for them. That's good, but it's not best. Go to work for him. God, I do this as unto you. I choose the better part. I choose what's best. Get anything out of the word today, church? Amen. Somebody say this with me. Say, God. I am not a hearer only, but I am a doer of your word. Say this with me. Say, I choose. We're making a choice right now. I choose as an act of my will to do my work as unto you, knowing that from you I will receive the reward of of the inheritance, for it is the Lord Christ whom I serve. Come on, give the Lord a thunderous applause of praise. Will you do it, church? Friend, we don't want to let this time go without giving you the opportunity to give your heart and life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, uh, you might be a good person. You might, have, you might not have ever hurt anybody or whatever, but the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you ever told a white lie, the Bible says that you don't deserve heaven. If you ever did anything wrong, the Bible says we don't deserve heaven. So we all need to come the way of the cross, the bloody cross. We need to come to Jesus and surrender our lives to him. We need to embrace the redemptive work of Calvary. We need to embrace what Jesus did by giving his sinless life up for us on a, on a bloody cross one day. Uh, and, and he died, and the Bible says he was buried. And the Bible says after three days, uh, according to the Jewish calendar, after three days, God brought Jesus back from the dead. Friend, Jesus is real. He's the only God only, I'll say religious icon for the sake of you understanding what I'm saying. Jesus is the only religious icon that ever gave his life for his people, died, brought himself back from the dead, and came to live on the inside of any person and every person who would believe him. No other religious icon, no other religious leader has ever done such a thing. Only the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. 
Friend, all you have to do is just simply open up your heart and life to him. And I'm telling you right now, if you'll do this and pray with me, you will never be the same again. Listen, the whole reason why we do everything we do, we don't have to live stream. We can just have a good time in God and just call it a day. But the reason why we do all the things we do and we buy the equipment and we live stream is for you. That's the whole reason why we do it. Just for you. We want to spend eternity in heaven with God, with you. And friend, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, come into my heart. So I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. We're all going to pray this prayer in this great gymnasium. If there's anybody in this gymnasium who is not born again, or maybe you're backslidden and you're not right with God, pray this prayer. Renew yourself with him today. Pray this prayer with me and mean it from the bottom of your heart. And the Bible promises that a miracle will take place on the inside of you. Friend, I'm telling you right now, if you will repeat after me and say this prayer with me, you will never be the same again. Let's all say this prayer together. Father God, I'm a sinner and I'm separated from you. But Lord, I apologize. I repent for living my life in a way that would grieve you. Lord, I do acknowledge that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Lord, I believe Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for my sin and on the third he was buried and on the third day you brought jesus back from the dead come into my heart lord jesus and never let me be the same again i thank you for hearing my prayer i am say this with me friend i am a blood washed child of god in jesus name amen Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I pray for you right now, and I come against every force of darkness that would try to steal this from you. But I pray that the Spirit of the living God would seal this in your heart and life for his glory in Jesus' mighty name. Now, friend, there are three things you must be intentional and you must choose to do. If you will be intentional and choose to do these three things, I promise you, in one year, you won't recognize your life. Number one, you got to pray. You say, preacher, how do I pray? What you do is you, you, you have to talk. Talk to God like you talk to your best friend. Just begin a dialogue with God. That's number one, you got to pray. Number two, you got to read scripture. I would start in the gospel of John because it's his love letter to you and it'll just make things kind of clear for you. You need to start in the gospel of John. So number one, you got to pray. Number two, start reading the Bible and the gospel of John. And number three, you got to get plugged into a good uh, local church I'm talking about a church that believes in the power of God, lifts up the mighty name of Jesus, believes in the Holy Ghost. You got to go to a church like that. If you're in the Western New York area, we just want you to know that the Oasis Road Outreach Center is available to you. We will love you and, and you would become family to us. And so, but the point is you need to find a good spirit-filled local church to get plugged into where Jesus is Lord, where they believe in the power of God. They believe in healing and all of these wonderful things things okay so uh, if you want help finding a church we can help you get in touch with us but you need to get pl plugged in to a good church if you do these three things if you'll pray read the gospel of john uh, starting in the gospel of john read the word starting in the gospel of john and you'll get plugged into a good church i promise you if you'll be faithful to do those three things for, for over a year you won't recognize your life for the wonderful things that god will begin to do now, friend, I'm praying for you right now. I don't have time to explain it all, but, but I just believe that there's no distance in prayer. I just believe that the Holy Ghost of God will meet you right where you're at. He will meet us right where we're at. So I'm praying for you right now to receive this um, next dimension called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I'm praying for you to receive that now. Be baptized in the very spirit of the living God. Be baptized in the Holy Ghost in the mighty name of Jesus with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. Friend, I want to encourage you, reach out to God in anything but English. Just reach out to him. It's not going to be the devil. It's not going to come from your head. It's going to be supernatural. It's going to be the spirit of the living God. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You can find it in the book of Acts chapter 2. But receive that now in Jesus' mighty name. Now, as a blood-washed son 
as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, standing in representation of the one who brought himself back from the dead with power and authority over every demon and devil of darkness. I speak to you sickness and disease. Take authority over you right now. You loose them and let them go free. Right now, in Jesus' mighty name, and I declare that they will never, ever be the same again for God's glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. 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 Somebody was diagnosed with cancer, and that can God is touching your body right now by his mighty power. You are healed of cancer in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. I bless you, and I praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Somebody with an infection in your ear, the ear is clearing up right now in the name of Jesus. It's clearing up. You're not deaf, but, you're, but you, um, everything is muffled in that one ear because you have an infection and you're in pain. In the name of Jesus, the power of God comes to you right now and releases you from that pain. I call you absolutely free right now for God's glory. Infection, dry up in Jesus' name for God's glory. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Somebody who's having a hard time swallowing, uh, it's like a knot in your throat. You, you, you've been concerned and, and, and fearful that it could be a tumor developing or whatever. I, I don't have that peace. I don't know what it is. I just know this. God's power is coming on you right now. He's touching you. Be set free in the name of Jesus. I want you to go right now. Act on your faith. Go get something to drink. Go get a glass of water and begin to drink it right now. I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, if you will begin to drink water, you will notice that that lump is, is going to begin to dissipate for God's glory in Jesus' name. Friend, you are completely free. You're a woman. You're completely free in the name of Jesus. That thing is deteriorating on the inside of you. I feel like God is touching people with goiters. If there's anybody watching that has a goiter, receive the anointing of God. Receive the power of God. It burns that thing off of you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody with a goiter, it could be a couple of people. with. I feel like it's a couple of people with a goiter. The power of God comes on you right now. There's somebody you're not going to notice a change right away. But as the days come, as the days come, you're going to see that thing um, change in color. And it's going to begin to shrink and dissipate. Somebody with a goiter. I feel like there's somebody with a goiter. Like It seems like it's right here here, uh, uh, under your cheek, uh, but right above your jawline. It's like, it's like a, a goiter uh, that's beginning to grow, but the power of God is coming on you right now, and you're going to notice that thing begin to dissipate and disappear for God's glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before I uh, close this out, is there any leader, uh, any leader or minister in this house that has a word of knowledge for someone uh, that could be in this place or watching uh, the live stream? Any leader or minister in this house with a word of knowledge? Thank you, Jesus. I admit I don't have it all. Uh, I admit that I bring a peace and everybody brings a peace. If there's somebody that has something, uh, this is the time. Do it now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless you and I praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I sense that there's somebody watching and you have, you've been, okay, this is what it is. You have an appointment to go to the doctor because of something, a, a, a skin situation on the tip of your nose, and it is cancer. Uh, the doctor, you have not been diagnosed yet, but I'm telling you right now, it is cancer. But I'm telling you right now, the power of God is coming on you in Jesus' name. And I call that skin area on your nose smooth as silk, smooth as a baby's behind in the name of skin, in the name of Jesus. You are healed for God's glory in Jesus' name. Still go for the appointment. Still go and let them do whatever they had planned to do. But I'm telling you right now that you are free from skin cancer on the tip of your nose in the name of Jesus. I feel like you're not even local. We're in the western New York area. You're somewhere down south or something of this nature. Somehow, some way, you're able, you're, you, you've been able to watch this. You might be watching it later, but God loves you so much he, that it's being addressed. That thing on 
on your nose, on the tip of your nose. Yes, it is cancer. Yes, it was cancer, but God is touching you by his mighty power. You are healed. He was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon him, and by his stripes you were healed healed friend receive the presence of God receive the power of God coming on you right now it's really weird it's really strange because I feel like as the power of God is on you I'm talking specifically to the person with the skin situation on the tip of your nose uh, I feel like that right now it feels like you're stuffed up like a person would feel if they had a cold you're stuffed up and and really what it is is it's the mighty power of God on your being bringing healing to that situation that's what that is and so what's going to happen is you feel stuffy and then all of a sudden it's going to just be like run your nose is just going to run don't think anything uh, don't think anything of it it's just I don't know why it's manifesting like that it's just the spirit of God on you but you are free from skin cancer for God's glory in Jesus mighty name Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Elder Coben, do you have anything? Anybody? Tanya, you got anything? Venetia? Carolyn? Thank you, Jesus. Chanel, you got anything? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Shinoshara, you got anything? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor Phyllis? All right. Thank you, Lord. I think that we're done then. Friend, we love you, and we look forward to seeing you the next time. God bless.